Hello, and welcome to a special live broadcast, a live chat with Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing. My name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I have with me in the virtual studio, James Kateman. James, welcome. Hey, how's it going today, Mark? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm so glad you were able to do this chat with me because uh, I've recently read the Bold Business Book. Um, yeah. awesome. I, I listened to the audio in your awesome voice, but I do have a, a print <laughs> copy because it's one of those books that you have to kind of have to highlight. Can you give me a bit of a background on uh, your background uh, as an entrepreneur? And, sure. uh, and, and eventually I want to lead to where the Bold Business Book came up from your experiences there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose just like any kid, I started businesses that didn't make money, selling whatever. <laughs> um, in 2006, I started my first real business. It was a printer, copy, repair place. I ended up selling that. I started another business called Answering Service, which is still going. We're on year 10 now, so that's cool. Whoa, but, 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years and lots of mistakes later. And some successes as well, so that's cool. Of course. Um, then I have business coaching, business called Draw and Customers Business Coaching, and then a couple other side hustles that every entrepreneur has, just other stuff going on. There's always right. the ideas in your head, about $5 million a day, and maybe two a year you try out. That is suspiciously like writers, right? Uh, a lot of writers yeah. have you know, a dozen ideas, and then they only have time to work on one or two. So the same thing as a, as a business person, right? Ideas oh, for absolutely. Business? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's the thing about ideas, right? They're a dime a dozen. Everybody's got ideas. It's the implementation that's the challenging part. So, I mean, you know, probably from talking to authors as well as would-be authors that everyone's like, oh, I always meant to write a book. And that's end of what they've done with it. Meant to. I always meant to start a business. Yeah, right. <laughs> Could have so how do you... How do you decide uh, when you have an idea for a business? How do you how do you take it from the implementation? Like, is is there a pattern? Is there a formula you follow to say, all right, this idea I can do something with? Yeah, I try to do the math to see if you can make money at it. And just like most entrepreneurs, or I suppose authors, I'm overly optimistic. So I'll give you a really brief example. I have, um, oh my gosh, is it easyorderflowers.com or justorderflowers.com? Both go to the same spot. And uh, it ends up at actually whateverblooms.com, which is flower ordering for people that don't care what flowers are actually sent because okay. we don't know flowers. I don't know if anybody picked up flowers for Mother's Day uh, yesterday and you just went to the store or you called up a flower shop and you're like, just send mom something nice. I don't oh, care what. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, the idea is that you tell us where it's going. You tell us which one on the card. You tell us how much you want to spend. And then essentially the flower shop takes care of the rest. Because they know what they're doing, right? They know that's what's the idea. Yeah, you and, the wow. So that's like a time saver. So you, you you throw your credit card in, and say, "Here's the address. Right? Here's the okay. It could be Mother's Day. It could be whatever. Yeah. Uh, just send something nice." Yeah, I want to spend whatever 60, 80 bucks, whatever on flowers. Just send them. Make it happen. Wow. Uh, the, the challenge that I didn't realize until later um, was that it takes a little while to program. So there's an expense there. Okay. And then it takes a lot of money to advertise. Flower shops, there's a lot of competition there with the big national chains. And then the flower shops, the local guys. Right. I'm talking 5 to $10 a click to advertise online when our margins are right around $5 an order. So not what I would call an immediately lucrative business. Right. The margins are so small that the time that you stick in it, just you don't get back. So that was one that I went down the road pretty far. And then I was like, eh, let's pause that one. So it's actually out there. You can order flowers from it, but it's not anything that we're actively marketing. Oh, yeah. You're not marketing it because the marketing would, would would cause your margin to either be negative or mm -hmm. shrink or something, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. We're trying to set up so you can have automatic, like it sends your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever you want, uh, flowers intermittently, but on somewhat of a scheduled basis. Oh, so it'd be geez. once a month, but it wouldn't be the 15th of every month, right? So it made it oh. look like you're the superstar. Like, oh, he's <laughs> just, got me flowers for no reason. Just because. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, right, 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 right. What's, so, what's the URL again for that? Sorry, It's whateverblooms.com. Whateverblooms.com. And whatever that's blooms. active, so I could go and, okay, this is kind of cool. I totally. like that. Just send whatever blooms. <laughs> 
that yeah, is really that's one of those okay. ideas implemented, and then we're like, oh, there's a lot of time and not a whole lot of money. So at least the money was in, in uh, parentheses. <laughs> so, <laughs> not the best kind. Yeah, yeah. No, I like real money as opposed to parentheses money. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is money you owe for being in business. Yay. <laughs> Wrong direction. <laughs> So you have done uh, talks for authors in front mm -hmm. of uh, audiences. I know in uh, Calgary at When Words Collide mm -hmm. um, is it one of the places. What was one of the things uh, coming from the business entrepreneurial side of things and then mm -hmm. going into the author sphere? Mm -hmm. I know you've authored uh, yourself. Yep. What's that? Is there a divide or is there a, a different mindset that you have to apply in, uh, as an author to think of it as a, as a business? Like, were, were there things that were, wow, authors really need to understand this? Yeah. Uh, one, I guess, similar to what we were talking about before, the whole implementation thing. There are a lot of people with ideas and they're just riding the hope train. They okay. hope they write the book. They hope they get published. They hope they make some money. And in their mind, the math makes sense. But in reality, since they're very slow to implement, they're not making any money and they're not having the success that in their mind they should or will hopefully maybe someday have. Okay. Same thing goes in business. I see it all the time. Business owners that are doing okay, there's essentially there's, there's comfort in complacency. When people are comfortable, that means that they're not growing. So they don't call it growing pains for no reason, right? So Wow. That's uh, some people just don't understand that you typically have to stretch outside of your comfort zone in order to be successful. That's why not everyone is successful in the way that every person would like to be. Wow. Wow. So you as an entrepreneur, as a, somebody who has started multiple businesses, obviously mm -hmm. started, had successful businesses, started some, had failures. <laughs> right. Is there a parallel into that uh, successful business and not le less successful business? Is there a parallel for, for authors and books? Yeah, I would say you don't know until you try. So okay. what I was telling people at the When Words Collide thing is just get your book out there. Uh, that's one thing, right? Just get it out there. See what the market is. See what it does. See what kind of results you have. And getting any results will help guide you to future results. Otherwise, okay. it's just speculation. So is there is there sometimes too much invested in this one single thing rather oh. than being open? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could you could certainly argue. I guess it depends. The rule that I have is that education is expensive, whether right. that's going to school or whether that's just learning school of hard knocks. There's no such thing as free education or rarely free education. Maybe cheap education, right? A little $17 book or something like that. <laughs> But okay. somebody paid for that education, and they probably paid a lot of money. So in the case of an author, maybe they had to stick their neck out and go through the, the time, right? Because that's not free. The time of writing the book, getting the book edited, publishing it by whatever means they had. There's going to be a time and a financial investment. And there's going to be your mother-in-law asking you, how's that book doing? When maybe it's not doing so hot yet or it's not ready yet. Right. So that's you got to stick your neck out a little bit. Okay, I like for a lot, <laughs> and and you did that. So uh, I want to talk about. Uh, well, you've written more than one book, but I want to talk specifically about the bold yeah. business book, right? <laughs> yeah. So you took it upon yourself to do this yourself. So you did not go for an agent and a publisher. Correct. You, as the entrepreneur, said, <laughs> "I got this." <laughs> how did yeah. that? How did you come to that conclusion? Well, uh, so my sister's an author, right, Sarah Cades. Um, so I asked her like, what does it take to get published? And she was telling me, well, first you got to find an agent. Once you find an agent, that agent helps you find a publisher. And once you find a publisher, that publisher sticks their hands in places that you don't want them necessarily to stick their hands <laughs> in the hopes that they'll sell lots of books. And I'm like, okay, what's the big deal? How long does that take? And she made it sound like it was months or years. And I was thinking months or years, I don't have months or years. I want this done. Now, so I just decided to go down the self-publishing route. Uh, one, because that has strong now. I mean, a few years ago, it wasn't nearly as strong. And it's evolved even since I published the Bold Business book. I think, and this is coming from a guy that only has a few books out, I feel like that is the wave of the future. Okay. It's like self-driving cars or something like that. Whether the 
people driving cars agree with that or not. Um, <laughs> whatever the big publishers, right? They're probably not huge fans of that. But I feel like we, the, I think the printing, like the physical process of printing, that has gotten to the point where it's very affordable to do low volume runs. So it's essentially print on demand, which means that the publishing house that used to have to print 20,000 copies to make it lucrative to sell individuals, that's kind of, it's an outdated model from my opinion, strictly my opinion. So of course, well, yeah, but no, but you, you looked at this, not as the average author looks at it. You looked at this with your business mind uh, on and made that decision that totally. you wanted it out fast. You wanted to be in control. Now mm -hmm. you released the paperback, the ebook and the audiobook. So you had it and hardcover, yep. And, and it's in hardcover too. So there's four formats. Mm -hmm. Why why did you decide to go with a full Monty on, on all of the different formats with that? Um well I was gonna do all of them except for the audiobook. Okay. But then I learned that not everybody reads. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that a lot of people that I say, hey, I give them a copy of the book. Hey, would you mind just reading this book? You know, just let me know what you think of it. Leave a review. That would be cool. And after you follow up with them after a few weeks, few months, and they're like, oh, yeah, I don't really read. I listen. <laughs> so that evolved into, well, I guess we're doing an audio book. So, and then I went down the audio book road and they're like, find someone to, to read it, whatever, and dink around like that. And it seemed to be, um, it was expensive. And I was like, I don't want to shop for a voice. And the editors that I had in the book told me that the book itself had a pretty cool voice. So I'm like, well, how about I just be the voice? I learned after the fact that uh, Amazon pays you based on the length of your book. And I talk about 10 to 20% faster than most voiceover <laughs> artists. So because I read the book, Amazon prices it based on length. So uh, you get the audio book a little bit cheaper than most other audio books of that. <laughs> word count so and i normally listen at uh speed and a half but i didn't have to do that with your book <laughs> <laughs> I just like we got stuff to do ground to cover times are wasting but i did like that because you could tell that you've done uh talks uh in front of people before because it was very much like i remember it was the winter time i was listening i was shoveling the snow while listening to you as well see i always have this memory of where i was when i was listening to your yeah. voice and, and and I ended up, I was enjoying it so much, I went to do some of the neighbor's driveways because I thought, well, yeah, I want to keep listening. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Um, so <laughs> you said something uh, when you talked about uh, giving people copies of your books and then following up. Now, that's something that um, uh, you do have a, a chapter or section of the book on the importance of follow-up. Mm -hmm. How uh, let's talk a little bit about that value. Like how important is it as an entrepreneur or an authorpreneur? How important is that follow-up? Oh my gosh. It's almost as important as writing the book. We, the interesting thing was when I published my book and I gave somebody a copy, I thought that I was giving them this great gift and that they were <laughs> going to take that great gift, read it, put it on the mantle, do awesome things, and then leave a review. I did not keep in mind that people have a life outside of my book. They got <laughs> spouses, kids, family, their own business or job, whatever that is. They got to mow their yard, shovel their snow, do all this other stuff that leaving a review for my book was not exactly on the top of their priority list, okay. even though how long does the review take, right? 10, 20 seconds, maybe Yeah, <laughs> a minute. If you put some thought into it, because I, from my point of view, I wasn't asking a ton, but from most people's point of view, I was asking a ton because I was essentially asking for their time in exchange for a book. So, and that's, that's tough. It doesn't matter what's in the content of the book. It'd be a super awesome book, incredible book, best book ever written. And still they're like a minute of my time. I'm not going to get that back. <laughs> so I even read it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I try not to be annoying to people, but eventually after you send 20 emails over the course of two years, like, okay, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so for them to read those 20 emails, if they would have read two out of those 20, that was more time than it would have taken for them to write a review. Right. So it's, it's interesting, man. You got to just claw your way to get reviews. It's bizarre. I never anticipated that.
Wow. So that was a bit of a surprise for you then. Oh, totally. Totally. Here's the book. Leave a review. Whatever star, right? Good, bad, and different, whatever. Hopefully you like it. But I just wanted reviews because I guess I wanted to know, and maybe this is a selfish thing, right? I wanted to know that I put out a good product, a right. great product, really. And reviews are one way to know that. So I'm very proud of the reviews that I have. But oh my gosh, I probably reached out to, oh man, I bet it's 700 people. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. Wow. So, yeah, okay, I mean, so this is something authors are not comfortable with. They're not comfortable with asking for anything or reaching out to people. But you reached out to 700 people and you've mm -hmm. got a probably a relatively small percentage of them actually took the time to. to yeah, leave out of those 700, there's probably 20, well, 20, 30 that left reviews. The other 20, 30 that are on there are just from people that I don't know. Luckily, okay. most of them are positive, so that's cool. Right. But yeah, the percentage of people leaving a review, and that goes with any business, right? It's just people aren't really interested in leaving positive reviews just based on an ask. Right. They're very quick to leave a negative review if you... Oh, <laughs> oh yes. I'm going to tell the world. <laughs> <laughs> but so you made them happy. They're just people. like, man, whatever. <laughs> but if you'd only asked 10 people, uh, you probably wouldn't have gotten any reviews. No, yeah. no. And of those 700, I probably asked each of them, I bet at least four times. And the ones that I got any play on or that I had a more personal relationship with, I probably approached annoyance. Okay. That's so a, that's like point. you got to ride that wave, right? Yeah. So where is like, that? Where is that balance? How do you, how do you, oh do you it's, oh, is it different for every relationship you have, I guess? Yeah. I guess I, there's some relationships that you got to, you got to kind of weigh the balance. What is this relationship worth to me? And if I have a business relationship with someone and I know that I'm a good contact for them, they're a good contact for me, but essentially it's a business relationship. A review for the book is a, it's a business thing that takes next to no time. There's no financial outlay. So I was cool with being annoying there okay. because my risk for the relationship is what well, this guy asked for a review way too many times. Really? <laughs> like that's your complaint. So <laughs> I was willing to be annoying there uh, wow. with buddies and stuff like that. I'm like, Hey, would you mind? <laughs> and some were cool and just, some just ignored it. So yeah, eventually after you try so many times, eventually there's just some where it's not worth reaching out anymore. Right. Okay. You've tried a dozen times, 20 times, five times, whatever it is for the given person. And if you didn't get a response, but you saw that they opened the email Move on, man. Okay. All right. Now, uh, we have a question from the live audience. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. So, L.A. Selby says, uh, do you seek reviews from readers who typically don't read your genre? Maybe don't read business books in your yeah. case. If so, does it impact how Amazon treats your marketing? Right? Oh, so a reader who normally wouldn't review a business book, I guess she's asking, or, yeah. or whatever the genre is. Yeah. That's an interesting question. So, the first part of that question, do I seek reviews from readers? Anybody that's literate, I'm seeking a review from. Okay. Presumably somebody that read the book, but if they read the book, for example, um, and don't have a business, they're not interested in starting their own business. Okay. I had a lot of people that read the book that just wanted to know about the one because they knew me and just another because they heard from other people that it touches on stuff that is applicable outside of business. Right. And it was actually useful. That was not the plan with the book, but it turned out that way. Okay. The second question does it affect my Amazon ads. Um, I'm gonna say no anymore because I stopped advertising on Amazon. Okay. And two, just because I mean we can talk about that later if you want. Um, the second answer to that is I don't know. I never went down the road of exploring that. Okay. Because the return on investment for that time just wasn't there. So yeah, it was the return on that investment. So I think I think what she was getting at with the question was. Uh, Amazon has algorithms based on customers and reading like things. Therefore, mm -hmm. if, if somebody who normally never reads a business book is suddenly reads this, but they read, uh, I don't know, they read uh, whatever, uh, dinosaur uh, erotica or something like sure. that. And and so normally you'd be showing this, uh, everyone who reads dinosaur erotica has suddenly seen a business book, which is the wrong customers probably, potentially. Right. Uh, right. Although they may do business. So I think... Um, 
I would argue that uh, early on, especially when you don't have any reviews, it's better to have a review than to not have any reviews, even if it's from the wrong customer, not the wrong customer base, but if it's not from people who only read business books or sure. entrepreneur, maybe, maybe that was the question. So, okay. Yeah, I guess I would say that there are people like you, Mark, that know that road way better than I even like I scratched the very tip of the iceberg on that. There's okay. so much knowledge that I just never took the time to explore. Okay. So, so much. <laughs> I, I, I didn't even know that was the thing. I just thought people that read books read books, right? I'm just like, I don't know. What's <laughs> well, that? no, but you read, like read certain things, right? Like I, I, I read oh. all over the map, right? So I'm, I'm all over the place. So Amazon can't get a beat on me. <laughs> but Wait, um, I, yeah. Yeah, I guess I assume that a lot of people were like that, or most people were like that, and that's wrong. Like my wife would probably never read a book like what I wrote. She's more romance or whatever, right? And yeah, I'm just didn't even think about that. Okay, which is, I mean, that's a failure on my part, right? I should. Well, which is that. why you and I are working together on uh, on a on a workshop for later this yeah. summer that we're going to talk about uh, at the end of this. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Because yeah. we combine the the knowledge that you have. And the knowledge Business that I authors, have, we right? can have peanut, a butter, peanut and butter and chocolate, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so you said something. So there's a quote I pulled out from the book that I quite loved where you said, challenges are only periods of growth veiled as obstacles. Can you elaborate yeah. on that a little bit more? Yeah. I get the impression that a lot of people feel like eventually it's going to be easy. Right, taken from an author, somebody starting a business, something like that. They think eventually, once they get all my ducks in a row, growth is just going to happen naturally and easily. And that doesn't happen. Now, I like to use the analogy of a tree, right? You look at a tree, trees just grow until they die. They just grow. But think of how much dirt they have to push out of the way. Roots that have to go through all kinds of rock and worms and all this kind of stuff. Like growth is to a point pain if you don't learn to enjoy it. So to right. assume that something's going to be easy is a fallacy. It's not true. So that's when I say that the complacency is comfort. You're not growing. Mm -mm. You got to gotta stretch beyond, which brings risk and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also want to go back to the, because you kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, and it's the lesson on borrowed time and that the, the best success comes from, and I know you'll probably finish this sentence. I have to think. Because <laughs> uh, I'm pulling for a good. Well, you said uh, the best success comes from getting the job done. Yeah, because you're going to know every single word from every single yeah, word right. in your book <laughs> off the top of your ago, Four years ago. <laughs> yeah, so the, it, like borrowed time. Uh, and that you talk about time having value, and often people don't oh, value totally. that. But then getting the job done is critical. Oh, it's necessary. Yeah, a job 90% done. I mean, think of a book that's 90% done and never published. Did you make okay. any money on that? Well, it's Did hard you to sell one? Did you share your knowledge with the world if you never published your book? Okay. I, I talked with one woman. She had, um, what was she doing? She was doing a history of her grandmother who had survived World War II in Germany, fled the U.S., all that kind of wow. stuff. okay. Great story. Phenomenal. I was like, oh, and this is when I was going through the process of self-publishing the Bold Business book. Okay. So I reached out, or she was a student in my class as an editor for okay. other uh, commercial stuff, editing things for other companies and stuff like that. And okay. she happened to be editing her mom's book, or her grandma's book, I'm sorry. And I'm like, where are you going to publish this? This is awesome. She's like, oh, we're not going to publish it. We're going to print five copies. Just give it to the family. <laughs> Oh my you God. went through all of that, even if you don't make a dime off of it. What does it cost to self-publish? A couple right. hundred bucks, maybe? The book is already done. Cover, editing, written. You right. would, I mean, it's a few clicks of the mouse to self-publish that thing. Well, once you've already paid for the editing and the cover, the cost totally. of self-publishing is free. <laughs> so, totally. So yeah. I, I just could not wrap my head around, why would you not want to share this story? This is a cool story. Yeah. Why would you not want to share that? Probably it could probably resonate with other people and say, "Oh my God, I, I, you know, that uh, that happened in my family too." Or maybe totally. I'm not alone. Uh, that right? You never know how it could help someone. Yeah. 
Wow. And it was just one of those like you like the finish line is half a step there, and you're like, right, I'm gonna go get some ice cream. <laughs> okay. Wow. Bye. Is there is there something in uh, you have like a six month plan mm -hmm. uh, for for business? Mm -hmm. uh, is there something that authors can apply when they do the same sort of forward looking when they when they look at their product when they look at their author brand whatever it is? Is there is there a similar parallel in the six month plan for for oh, sure. to consider? Yeah, yeah. I, my rule is to systematize everything. Okay. So you know. The rule is that you only have to do what is important for your business at this moment in time. So I feel like authors, a lot of business owners probably get overwhelmed because they think, oh my gosh, there's 5 million steps that I have to do. And it's something actually that we're going to talk about at our presentation at When Words Collide is the step, systematize it, boom, boom, boom. Okay. To get it all set so that there's no confusion, there's no deer in headlights look, there's no like, eh, what do I do next? You just figure out, just lay out your plan, six months. Knock it out. Okay, and and that's a that's a critical step. Then is actually taking the dream, the vision, the goals, the plans, totally. and really making a, a concrete effort. Yeah, I like to think of it like a recipe. Like maybe your grandma or great grandma can make a chocolate cake that she's been making for decades without really thinking about it. Right. But if you or I want to make that cake, we have to have that recipe. Otherwise, we may end up with something coming out of the oven, but it won't be chocolate cake. Or it won't be good. <laughs> so you want to figure out your recipe and then make your recipe. Okay. Then you need to tweak here and there as you're going along. But for the most part, you make your plan, you stick to it. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. that's kind of cool. So I, I watched a video of you online uh, talking about something I struggle with. Okay. I'm pretty sure most people struggle with. All right. And it was inbox zero. Oh, and you, you broke zero. it down, but again, you broke it down into some simple chunks. Could you mm -hmm. quickly just outline? Because I know that will benefit people who are watching and listening. Sure, sure. Yeah, so the reason I should say that inbox zero is a big thing for me is because just like when you walk into a dirty room, your mind is just, it's overwhelmed even before you started the task. Okay. So every day we have to look at our inbox and we got to knock out those emails, right? But if you have an inbox of 36,000 emails, your mind says, no freaking way. Never going to happen. You're not going to finish them up. <laughs> right, so yeah. let's just knock out five. <laughs> it was just like, okay. <laughs> so also, a lot of good stuff gets lost. You end up on all these email lists. You get stuff. You get people trying to schedule stuff over email with you that takes 27 emails when it would have taken a 30-second phone call. It fills up your inbox. And therefore... Your inbox is multiple pages, so there may be emails in there, somewhere in there, that are actually important, money-making, huge opportunities that are just lost because there are so many. Right. So what I like to do is get people into Inbox Zero, and the process is to essentially use folders. So create a folder, for example, that I like to use called Six Month Temporary. Okay. Just take everything in your inbox, put it in the Six Month Temporary folder. And then you can look at your inbox and it's actually inbox zero right then. It's liberating. Immediately. Liberating right there. <laughs> then as emails come in, then you can say, well, this is junk. I respond to this one. This one goes in the six month temporary folder, six month temporary folder. I use it's a rolling six months. So if an email comes in, I respond to it. And let's just say I may need to search for this email eventually over the course of time. But after six months, that email is probably not that important in your business or in your life. Maybe that's a one year, one year folder, two year folder, something like that. Six month is a works for me and my business. So I'll just give you an outline of what to do, but you can tweak as you see fit. Okay. Then after you have that, your thousands of emails in the six month temporary, then just take some time and pick a date. Let's just say I'm only going to look at anything one month and newer. Because if you haven't responded and it's over a month, that train has left the station. It's gone. Forget about it. Right. The next time you delete the emails that are older than six months, out the door. Somebody reaches out to you and says, hey, did you ever see that email, you know, from April or whatever? And you're like, oh, yeah, I can search. No one's going to say like, hey, did you get that email from 2015? <laughs> no, didn't happen. <laughs> no. You never responded. No, resend it. We're all good. 
Okay. <laughs> but you essentially want to keep your inbox as clean as like you keep your kitchen or something of that nature. So okay. you can get more work done without thinking, oh my gosh, this is a mess. Right, right. You're not having to clean the dishes before you cook something. Right. Okay. All right. So so here's here's a thing I ran into when I was trying to implement that. Yeah. Uh, I use Gmail. And okay. so what, what I ran into is there are emails that go back to 2015 mm -hmm. that I may want to find. Mm -hmm. But what I learned is I can archive them instead totally. of deleting them. Mm -hmm. And they're still there if I ever needed to find them, you know, yeah. in six months when I got to go, well, that, that email from the publisher that had the contract clause or whatever, and I need to go look it up. Because again, it's easily retrievable on the cloud. Totally. Uh, but so I, so some people may panic when they hear delete because they're, you know, like hoarders like me, right. digital hoarders. And they're like, no, I might need that, that picture I took of a, my sock <laughs> from 2001 <laughs> or whatever. So that's something that maybe if, if people are a little bit leery about that, um, panicking over that deletion, would that be something that could uh, tide them over and go, you can always oh, still totally. get it. Yeah, I have a folder. Well, I have a few folders, right? You think of it just like filing. That's the analogy that they use now, right? Think of your inbox right now is pretty much just a pile in the middle of a room. Okay. You got 20,000 sheets of paper there. I got to find something. Ooh. How many of those sheets of paper are really important? So you could, for example, you could take your 50,000 emails or whatever's in your inbox, put them in a folder that's just dated uh, inbox zero quest or something like that. <laughs> so if ever you have to go back to them, they're there, but they're archived. You don't want them to be seen every single day. When yeah, you don't when you have to do anything with them every single day. Okay. You want to clear so just because it's not in your inbox, it can still be archived or filed in a folder that you can access later. It's just not interrupting you or overwhelming you in your day. So it's your it's you're thinking about it as an inbox on your desk, a physical inbox that is empty. Huh. Mm -hmm. Or when you get up, it's like it's only the five emails that came in or 20 that right. came in or 100 that came in while you were sleeping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah, I get in the neighborhood of let's say 100 emails a day. Okay. 75 of them are junk. Okay. So they're very, very easy to get rid of. Some of them are not necessarily junk like spam or anything like that. They're right. just stuff that's notifying me of something. I don't, I don't, excuse me. I don't have to take any action on them shy of just moving them into the six month temporary folder. Okay. The other 25, you just respond or take the action steps that they need. Right. And my rule is you don't touch an email more than twice. Okay. So you just, Move along so you don't have to be like, oh, stare at that. Oh, I got to take care of that email. Oh, I got to take care of that email. <laughs> Those stack up very okay. quickly. And I think I think that is something that can probably be applied in uh, different aspects of people's lives, right? Oh, Not totally. just the inbox, Everywhere. but in general, when they go to make a business decision, mm -hmm. when they decide, am I going to work on this book or that book? Am I going to whatever, right? They can, they can probably attribute similar virtual folders in their uh, minds. Yeah. I would, it also helps to make decisions because you, you remove the information that you don't need. What is the applicable information? Right. So it's just like those story problems you had way back when, where they gave you a bunch of information that wasn't relevant to the story problem, right. to what you were trying, you know, like two trains are coming. One is red. <laughs> uh, we don't care about the red. We don't care what color it is. But the resistance in the air from red. No. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the sun is at this 15 degree angle. Yeah. Doesn't okay. matter. That's just <laughs> it's getting in the way of you thinking because we can only concentrate on so many bits of it, information at a time. Right. So we want to remove the junk, pay attention to the important stuff. I love that. I love that. And I love the fact that you're system systematizing. And I see Susie's just commented says zero uh, inbox zero goals. Goals, make it happen. <laughs> make it happen. Yeah. I love awesome. that. Awesome. So uh the system I uh, systemization. Uh mm -hmm. so uh your sister Sarah. Uh, had been trying for a long time to get the two of us together. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will be doing a free workshop at Winwords Clyde, uh, yeah. winwordsclyde.org in August. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it's a virtual conference this year, again, people can attend from anywhere. Yeah, whole world. Um, and then we are doing a business masterclass full day workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, author boot camp. Uh, and, that, and that's basically you bringing that business Let's get rid of the junk. Let's focus on <laughs> right. organization. And then uh, I'm coming more from understanding the business of writing and publishing. And Sarah was our protege, was the author that we've kind of put through the boot camp mm -hmm. in trying to get her on track with her writing. 
Mm -hmm. We're kind of exploring how that work has come together, but also creating a system. Can you talk a little bit more about what that day is going to entail? Yeah, essentially we will take authors or want to be authors from that hope and that's um, maybe we'll call it lackluster drive. Okay. And it's probably a little bit lackluster because they don't necessarily know the next steps or they have a vague idea of what the next steps or okay. they have one of that. Oh, I should do this or I think I'm going to do that. Okay. We're going to take all that. We're going to remove the junk, remove the head trash, and then we'll systematize it. So it's a very clear if then. So you knock out this step, you knock out this step, you okay. knock out this step, with the end result being a published book. And with any luck, you start making money off that book. Good stuff. Good stuff. I love that. I, I'm going to uh, pop up a comment from uh, uh, Christy who says, yeah. I love the idea of applying inbox zero to decisions I get. Analysis paralysis. Yeah, I oh, understand yeah. that. Uh, she says, thank you. I'll be looking uh, for your book and can't wait to see you at uh, When Words Collide. Thank Yay! you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cool. cool. I'm excited. So, uh, James, thank you so much for spending the time uh, with me here today. We will close with a bit of a, a video ad that I created for this author uh, this author boot camp. Uh, and there's the, the link I, I dropped up on the screen earlier, uh, which is basically uh, bit.ly slash uh, author boot camp. Uh, and people can go check that out to see, and they can attend from anywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So we can have up to how many people? Uh, 300. In the, 300, up to 300 people can attend. So you don't have to be in Calgary, <laughs> which is where One Words Clyde normally takes place. Um, where can people find uh, find out more about you uh, online? If they go to drawincustomers.com, they can see all kinds of stuff. We got podcasts up there. We got blogs up there videos, all kinds of information about business. Awesome. awesome. Helping people be bold and having fun. Yeah. Helping people have a bold business, right? uh, business uh, entrepreneurs and the business of being an author, I think, which is also totally. critical. Yeah. Awesome. Well, James, uh, thank you so much again for spending the time sharing your wisdom and uh, thank you guys for uh, watching uh, this live. We're going to now close with, uh, with a bit of the, the video ad that I promised you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Mark.